basically have two general types of mounds in Florida. First of all are the shell mounds, and you've probably seen these all over. But they're typically either oyster shell or snail shell. And they're also earthen mounds. Now shell mounds came into being in the late archaic around 4,000 or 4,500 years ago. The earthen mounds come, come a little later. They come more with a little more complex society once Florida started getting a little more populated. And today some of these mounds are really hard to pick up in the landscape. A lot of them have suffered from erosion, a lot of them have been suffered from destruction by humans, uh, they've been trampled down, so sometimes they're very hard to detect. And it was Thomas Jefferson who was the first to really excavate one of these mounds. Um, he had mounds near his home up in Virginia. And he recognized kind of the curious aspect of these mounds because there were a lot of people that had different theories of what these mounds were, how they were formed. In fact, in Florida, one of the main theories was that they were just a result of hurricanes, blowing big piles of shells together. People didn't know. So Je Thomas Jefferson excavated the mounds near the Ravana River. Uh, and he was the first to really recognize the fact that things that were deeper in the mound were typically older than the things on the surface, which is our laws of the principles of uh, stratigraphy. And one of the most probably intriguing and sad, one of the most probably intriguing and sad aspects of these shell mounds are their role in the use of road construction in early Florida, because this is what how most of our early roads originated, was from the fill from these. In fact, we have numerous photographs of them uh, mining these. In fact, that it, this practice got so extensive that we see a shift in the terminology. No longer are they shell mounds, they're now shell pits, because they're basically mining these things and they can buy pieces out of them for road usage. And then we start seeing them show up in commercial products. These postcards, again, are the announced of the Florida, Shell Mounds of Fort Worth Island. And this one I kind of got a kick out of because Turtle Mountain used to really contain interesting Indian relics. It's almost inviting the public to come check out this mound. You might find something kind of us. So it's all, it almost being used as part of the tourist campaign at this point. But today, fortunately, these things are now used for educational purposes. In fact, they start, as we did more research into these, we found that they were such interesting aspects of prehistoric Florida, and many of them have come under protection. Many parks have been centered around these, like Crystal River and uh, uh, Lake Jackson site, and many of these uh, fell under the Coral Act, which passed in 1979, which was the Conservation and Recreational Lands Program instituted under Florida Statute 259, and it protects these and makes parks surrounding them. I, I think it's really educational, if you will, to consider, you know, what we, uh, what we do in the field, you know, what we actually do in the field as a practical matter, right? And that's what I want to share with you today, and the, 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 the way I want to share it with you is to show you the stuff in my backpack. Of course, um, cameras or a camera, um, and uh, why do we carry cameras? You know, the purpose of archaeology is not to collect artifacts. The purpose of archaeology is to collect information. And, um, you know, we get some of the information from the artifacts that we collect, but we also collect a lot of other information that's not directly related to the artifacts, including things like uh, geology and geomorphology and environment of sites and the stratigraphy of sites, the layering of sites and things like that. And, you know, taking pictures of things is one way to record information about them. Now this is a tape measure, obviously, but it's a very big tape measure, right? And guess what? Metric, right? In science, we operate with metric system. This is actually 100 meters long. And um, uh, why, do you, why do you think we have such big tape measures that we carry them? Sites. Are big. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, we're, we're, we actually make maps of sites. We actually make maps, scale maps of sites, and scale drawings of things in the sites. The Marshall Town Trial. The Marshall Town Trial. The Archaeologist Fitting Trial. Right? And then more tape measures. But we use the steel tapes, the small steel tapes, for a different purpose. Not so much for mapping sites as for. Um, 
as for laying out our excavation pits. The way you lay out a unit like this is you run, you know, one tape along an edge, and um, actually, what you do is you create a triangle. One tape this way, and one tape that way. If you just try to, um, if you just try to kind of use a tape and go around the edges, you end up with a parallelogram. <laughs> the, only way, the only way to get to get the, all the angles and distances right is to do the diagonals. You can see that I think basically what the what we're doing is we're we're planning and prepared to make very careful systematic observations and measurements on natural phenomena and um, and record them. So I hope I hope you learn something about what we actually do in the field today. Uh, the Everglades started to form, what, maybe 8,000 years ago, something like that. It was much drier several thousand years ago. And um, so it didn't always look like it does today, but that's sort of like what, that happens to be Pine Island and Long Key, but it was as good an example. Got all these artificial lakes all over the place, and there's lawns and trees, invasive species. So it's very, it, it very much masks the, these changes that have occurred, mask what the environment looked like just over 100 years ago. What, what were uh, the natives doing with the ocean? Well, of course, it was a supermarket for them. But, so it was Publix and Winn-Dixie, but it was also Home Depot for them. It's where they got their tools. Why didn't they use stone? Didn't have it. There was not stone around here that you could use for tools. And of course, the river courses were very important. Miami, uh, on the Miami River, and uh, Fort Lauderdale on the New River. And this is right behind the police station. And you can see it had, had some tall pines in there, uh, various kinds of uh, palms, palmettos, and occasional oak tree. The Ridge and Slough, and this is the big the big story here for archaeology in, in Southeast Florida it was the supermarket for the Glades people, the Tecesta, if you will. And the Ridge and Slough had two major components as it relates to archaeology, tree islands and uh, the Pine Island and uh, Long Key. And the reason it's called Ridge and Slough is, is there's slime rock ridges under, underneath the, the soil, and those ridges would catch material vegetative material as it flowed in that very slow flow of the, uh, the Everglades, the river of grass, they catch it and form a head. All right, a little bit of dirt, a little bit of dirt, and then the natives would go, and this is where they were doing their foraging. We Westerners were not the first people to leave our footprints in the mud. Uh, <laughs> the, the Everglades would not look like this had it not been for human habitation being there for thousands and thousands of years. And that's what a tree island looks like today. But they would come to this site and what are they going to do? They need to build fires. So they would start taking and clearing out any dead wood that would you know, have been firewood. Uh, the underbrush would have been cleared away by the time they left. It would have been a bit more park-like in its appearance. Pre-drainage, pre the big canals, before the big canals were built, water, this would all be watered in here, and it would flow this way and this way. Now you notice, notice this line. See that line? That's called an ecotone. And that's where two, two different reg regimes of vegetation meet and, and mix. And that's what they look like today on the ground. So those those are probably pre-drainage trees that survived. They were the ecotone, ecotone, that's E-C-O-T-O-N-E, uh, between the high ground and the, the water down in that, in that transverse glade. So you can see that I thought it was fascinating that, that they would survive.